I just want to thank the Lord for the opportunity to be in his house because I consider it a privilege and an honor just to be here. And I feel the most unworthy of anyone here, Brother Rickett, tonight. But, you know, it's just all about Jesus. And it's just all about getting to heaven. And it's all about missing hell. You know, that's really in a nutshell what salvation is all about. But, you know, I was thinking as I was singing that song, <clears throat> you know, you that are watching uh, on the Church of the Air, and we appreciate you uh, watching with us tonight, um, I may not know your name. And personally, I, don't, I may not know everybody that's watching or listening, but I was thinking about Jesus, how he knows your name. And if you don't make it to heaven, he's going to miss you. Because Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you, whatever your name is. My name is Kim, and Jesus died for me. And I'm one of his children, Sister Barnett, and he doesn't want me to miss heaven. But he died on Calvary, and he was crucified, and he, he climbed up that hill called Calvary to save my soul from eternal damnation in hell. You know, a lot of people don't want to hear that kind of talk anymore. You know, they want you just to make them feel good. But you know what? Hell is not going to feel good, Brother Rickett. But heaven is going to feel really good. And I don't know about you, but I want to choose heaven. And I want to make it by the grace of God. And, we, and us that are Christians, we're not home yet. So we can't really sit down and be at ease in Zion. We, we really have a lot to do for the Lord. Um, you know, even if we think we're perfect and we've got it all together, you know what? We've got a long ways to go to get home. We're not home yet, Brother Staten, but by the grace of God, we're going to get there. But I was praying early this morning, and the Lord put these scriptures on my heart, and I just want to obey Him. Revelations 22 and 17 says, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And I just love that last sentence. It says, And whosoever will, that means you. That means whatever your name is, whatever town you live in, wherever community, where, wherever you are, if you're in prison, if you're in the hospital, wherever you're at watching this on the television screen, that is your name. You have received an invitation by Jesus Christ. He said, whosoever will. You know, when people get married, they send out invitations. They only invite sometimes their closest friends. Some people just invite their family. But Jesus said, well, in the word of God right here it says, Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. You know, whosoever will. So you have received your invitation. It's up to you whether you come to, to the Lord tonight because he is definitely calling someone to him. And he said, after you come, let him take of the water of life freely. You know, a lot of people say in this world, nothing is free. And I just about believe that. You know, nothing is pretty much free in this world. You have to pay for everything you get. Uh, you can't even go fishing without a license. You can't own a gun without a permit. There's just so many things that you can't enjoy even freedoms without paying a somewhat of a price for it. But Jesus Christ paid the price. He came to this earth. He lived and he died. And he paid the ultimate price. And he died. He took his last breath just for your salvation tonight, for you to be saved. And he said, come and take of the water of life freely. So you don't have to be rich. You don't even have to have a dollar. You don't even have to have a dime in your pocket. You may not even own a 
home. You may not own a car. Like I said, you might be in a prison cell and you don't even own a maybe a t-shirt or a pair of shoes. But you can have Jesus tonight. And I was at a funeral one time and I never forgot what this preacher said. He said, if you have Jesus Christ, you're rich. If you have Jesus, you're the richest person on the face of this earth. And there's actually scriptures to really back that up tonight. And I have a few more scriptures I want to read to you. I just want to obey the Lord tonight because I know without a shadow of a doubt Jesus Christ is calling somebody to his side. Will you say yes to Jesus or will you say no? You know, if you say no, there's going to be really bad consequences. Just this week, I witnessed someone uh, witnessing to some lost folks and they just took it lightly and they just laughed it off. And I stood there in my heart, just I felt so sick inside, like how can they just laugh about it? You know, if you're on your way to hell, I wouldn't laugh about it. If you don't know that you're saved, I wouldn't take that lightly. You know, uh, people say, well, I've heard this preached, you know, my whole life, and nothing's ever going to change, nothing's ever going to happen. But there's one thing about it. One day, we're going to take our last breath on this earth, and we're not always going to be here. And I was thinking about how I work in the public, and I can ask people, how are you doing today? And they'll say, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, there's a lot of people, they're doing so-called great right now because they have a fine house, they have a fine car, and maybe they have a companion that loves them and a beautiful family and plenty of money in the bank. And, you know, they might be the richest person in the world, but if they don't have Jesus, it's going to be bad after a while because we're not going to take it with us, whatever we have down here. One time a preacher used the illustration and he said, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. That w was kind of comical in a way, but it's so very true. You won't take one thing with you when you go. And there's nothing wrong with having things in life. There's nothing wrong with having money. But the thing about it is, if you love that more than you love God, well, then you won't make it to heaven because we have to love God above everything, above anything. We've got to love Jesus, and we've got to put him first in our life. But I want to read a few more very important scriptures tonight that the Lord has laid on my heart. And these are the words of Jesus Christ. It's Luke 16 and 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So see, he was happy every day. I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. Probably walking around, Sister Bobby, maybe with a, you know, a whistling and singing a song, having a good life, just enjoying life. You know, nothing wrong with going fishing, but maybe going fishing, going hunting, just enjoying the happy things of life, enjoying his life. But it says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Lazarus was not having a very happy time. He was full of sores and Apparently, he was in a lot of pain. And, and verse 21 says, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Apparently, he was hungry. All he wished he had was some crumbs from the rich man's table. I mean, I could just imagine him maybe looking in the window and they've got all the fine food on the table and I love to eat and I know most people do. And he maybe saw that food on the table and he saw crumbs falling from the table and he was so hungry, maybe his stomach was growling. I wish I just had that crumb there. 
I just wish I had the leftovers. I just wish I had one piece of chicken that they're enjoying in there. But instead, I'm out here, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm got these sores on me, and I'm hungry. But nobody wouldn't help him. Nobody didn't want to help him. And, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. That does not sound very pleasant to me. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died. See, there's an end to this life. The, the beggar was in pain and misery, but he died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And if I was speaking for anybody tonight, I feel like I'm speaking for that rich man in hell. And there's not only one rich man in hell, there's a many of souls in hell right now what? that would give anything uh, if they had one more chance, uh, if they could just do it over, uh, if they could just call back one day of their life, they would do it different. They would do it over. But he lifted his eyes in hell, being in torments. And then he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, See, now he's beginning to pray. Have mercy on me. You know, he said, don't forget me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And when I was a young person, I went to a church and a preacher, he had a bucket of water and he, he towed it around down and up and down the aisles of the church. And he preached about how there wouldn't going to be no water in hell. There's not going to be nothing down there to, to ease our pain if we go there. But you know, the rich man, he didn't ask for a swallow of water. He didn't ask for a bottle of water. He didn't ask for a pitcher of water. But all he asked for was just a just one drop, just to cool the pain on his tongue. He was that desperate. All he asked for was just a little bit of relief. Just send me a little bit of help. But, but guess what? Help was not available. It was too late. Too late. Too late. Too late for the rich man. He said he was tormented in this flame. Have we? I know I've burnt myself. I have a few scars to prove it. Uh, it just with an oven. Have you ever just accidentally burned yourself? And the first thing you do is you pull away and say, ouch. And then you've got this horrible maybe scar and that pain that you felt. But when we burn ourselves down here, most of the time, it's just but for a moment, you know. But it hurts really bad to be burned. And I've seen people that were burned badly, but I don't know the pain that they feel, but I've heard them talk about it. And my grandmother was burned before she died. She was trying to light a cigarette outside, and she had um, some uh, Vicks salve on her neck where she put it on there. She's just an old, old timer. She did that like the old timers did. She put it on at night, I believe, but she walked outside that Monday morning on December 9th, and she lit that cigarette up when she did. The wind got in it, and when the wind got in it, <clears throat> it um, caught her on fire, and it burnt the almost entirety of her body, and uh, she didn't really live to, to long enough to be able to talk or tell us about it, but even that was just, but for even as horrible as that was, that had an end to it. But hell has no end to it. When we get burned and go to hell, there will be no end to it. He said he was tormented in the flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime 
receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. You know what? There was someone that would have probably went down there and got him out of hell. And you know what? I have a family member that I don't know if they made it to heaven or not. But you know, it like to drove me crazy for two years after he died. But you know, I finally realized after two years that I can't do anything about it. If this person in my family is in hell tonight, I cannot go there. And I can't get him out. But if I could, I would. If I could, I would. If I could get anybody out of hell, I would. But I don't have the ability to do that. And tonight, if you're sitting here and you got breath in your life and you're alive and you're hearing this message, then through Jesus Christ, I have a chance to ask you not to go to hell. The Lord is trying to pull somebody out of hell tonight. Okay, you're not there yet if you're hearing this message. You got a chance. As long as there's breath, there's hope. But once a person goes there, oh, God, oh, we don't know the severity. We cannot imagine total darkness and being tormented. A, a young man died, and he went to hell. And he said, as he was going down there into that thick darkness, going around and around, he said, oh, no. He said, God, no. What? He said, I'm going to hell. He said, no, God, no. And as he kept turning, he said it got hotter and hotter as he kept turning. And he saw pictures of his life. And he saw church services where they asked him to pray. And he got up and left. And God was showing him his life where he refused Jesus Christ. But guess what? This was more, more, almost more than a miracle to me. This was a true story. He had a praying mother at home. She was making biscuits. And the Holy Ghost hit her. And she got her husband and she said, Honey, we got to pray. She said, Willie Ray's in trouble. It pays to be in touch with God, to be in tune with God. She said, let's pray. They fell down on their knees, not knowing the severity of the case. And they began to call on God. And their son came out of hell and woke up in a hospital bed. And God gloriously saved his soul and called him to preach. And I heard him preach the message with my own ears. I heard him on tape. I'm telling you a powerful testimony about how real hell is. He said it was a thick darkness like he had never, never imagined that type of darkness before. But that was just more than a miracle. God pulled him out of there so he could come back and tell others. <clears throat> but in verse 27 it says, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. See, the rich man, he's still praying. Now he's not concerned about himself anymore. He knows he's not going to get any help, but he's worried about his family. <clears throat> Verse 28, For I have five brethren that he, <clears throat> that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear, them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one, he really believed this, if one went 
unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Basically what Jesus is saying, if you will not hear the preached word of God, if you won't hear the anointed word of God and through the Holy Ghost and you reject it, you wouldn't believe it if the rich man came in here today and said, hey, Israel, don't go there. Don't go there. But you would still reject him. But we cannot afford to reject Jesus Christ because I'm 100% sure that he's coming soon. Sooner than we think. Hell is real. I'm telling you, if, if I saw someone in a burning car, I would want to try to get them out. If you saw someone on fire, wouldn't you want to try to put that fire out? Especially if it was one of your family members. You would do everything in your power. There have been mothers when their houses were burning and their babies were inside, Sister Staten, and fathers, and they went back in. They were going to save them babies, and they ended up dying with them. But I'm telling you, Jesus is trying to pull somebody out of the lake of fire tonight. We may not have tomorrow. We may not have five minutes from now. But we've got this moment. And you can accept him in your heart. Tonight is the night. But you know, a lot of people fall in this category right here. This is Acts 26 and 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, which Paul was the preacher there, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Oh, God. How many of us will fall into that category? <clears throat> I almost got saved that night, but I didn't. Jesus knocked on my heart, and I almost said yes, but I didn't. I heard a story about a young man. He was in a church service. The Holy Ghost conviction fell. And the preacher begged him to get saved and said, Don't walk out of this house. Don't walk out of this house. Not saved tonight. But the boy did not pray. And he got on his motorcycle and he took off. And not, I don't know, maybe a mile from the church when service was over. There was a horrible accident, and the boy on the motorcycle had hit an 18-wheeler head on, and they had to dig his body out of the grill of the 18-wheeler. That's how fast someone can leave this world. But are we prepared to meet our God? It's a question that only we can answer between us and God. I'm nobody's judge. I would be the last person that would ever judge anybody. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, I mean whosoever, I don't care what you've done, where you've been, I don't care what sin you've committed, as long as you had not blasphemed the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> And if you don't know what the Holy Ghost is, then I know you haven't blasphemed it because a lot of people don't really know what the Holy Ghost is. But he said, whosoever will should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, we're going to live on either way, Brother Ricky. We're going to live on for eternity because we are a living soul and, and we are going to live on. <clears throat> but the Bible says, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. What love. I believe there's another scripture that says, you know, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He loved us. How could he love somebody like me, Sister Barnett? A, a ugly, rotten sinner like me that I was before I came to him. How could he do it? 
How can he love the murderer? Uh, I knew a preacher, but he first, before he got saved, him and his brother were not saved. They were at a bar. They got into a fight at the bar, and he stabbed his brother, and on the way to the hospital, his brother died lost. He was raised in a holiness church. He was raised by a God-fearing mother. Well, the, the brother that did the stab, and he didn't mean to kill his brother. He was in a jail cell. His mother came in there and said, How could you have done it? How could you have done it? And he later on, he got out of jail, and he got saved and became a preacher. But every day of his life, he was haunted by that. He was haunted. He said, I sent my brother to hell. He felt like it was his fault. But he, he really was haunted by that. But yet God saved him. God will save a murderer. God will save the vilest sinner. I don't care what it is. I don't care if people hate you for it. God will forgive you. And God will save you. But you have to accept Jesus Christ. I've been hearing a lot of people say that Jesus will not come to your house unless you invite him in as far as into your soul. You have to open the door and allow him to come in. You have to want him. You have to accept him. You have to repent of your sins. Repentance is ask God to forgive you and be in godly sorry and wanting to change your life. Are you tired of the life you're living and the road that you are traveling? Is that road your own leading to heaven or is that road leading to hell? And this is going to be the end, close of the message, uh, Sister Bobby. But uh, for those that are here, I'd like to just give an altar call. If my husband would come and help me, I might sing a song. And if anybody here wants to pray, you know, <clears throat> prayer is a wonderful thing. Let's just obey the Lord.